Howdy, this is Jimmy Aiken, author of A Daily Defense, and you're listening to Pints with Jack. My first taste of Oxford was comical enough. Towns always show their worst face to the railway, but as I walked on and on, I became more bewildered. Only when it became obvious that I was getting to open country did I turn round and look. There, behind me, far away, never more beautiful since, was the fabled cluster of spires and towers. This is Pints with Jack, Season 6, Episode 44, Surprised by Oxford, After Hours with Dr. Carolyn Weller. Welcome everyone. Here on Pints with Jack, we're reading our way through the works of C.S. Lewis, and today's opening quotation comes from C.S. Lewis's spiritual autobiography, Surprised by Joy, where he describes his first encounter with Oxford, a city which would have a lifelong impact on him, as well as on the other Inklings. And today, I'll be speaking with someone else who has also been greatly impacted by that city, Dr. Carolyn Weber, who recounts this experience in her book, Surprised by Oxford. In today's episode, we'll be talking about her book, the movie adaptation, as well as the influence of that special city of dreaming spies. But first, a little bit about our guest. Dr. Carolyn Weber is an award-winning author, popular professor, and international speaker. She has served as faculty at several universities and was the first female dean of St. Peter's College, Oxford. She lives in a quirky old house out in the country with her family, along with their animal menagerie. And, as mentioned, She's the author of Surprised by Oxford. Dr. Carolyn Weber, welcome to Pints for Jack. Thank you so much for having me. This is a delight. Yeah, it's been lovely to finally talk to you. It was actually funny. I don't normally find my guests this way, but I think I saw, I think I saw on Twitter uh, the trailer for the movie Surprised by Oxford. I can't remember why I found it. Maybe I was just searching for C.S. Lewis in general or Oxford, but I watched the trailer and I thought, oh, a movie about Oxford. Oh, I'll have to let our... Uh, Slack supporters and people who uh, follow follow our website will have to let them know about this. And the more I dug into the background of the story, the more I thought, oh, there's definitely an episode here. And I mentioned it on our Slack channel, which our Patreon supporters can gain access to. And it was kind of like I came late to the party. Everyone went, oh, yeah, surprised by Oxford. Love the book. Didn't know that there was a movie coming out. So uh, this is really me playing catch up. Oh. <laughs> Well, I don't know if there's much to play catch up on, but yet the film finally came together this year. So they finished the filming last year and it debuted in uh, at the Heartland Film Festival in October to really strong reviews, which was wonderful. And it, I think the latest update is it's looking at being released in the fall. Wonderful. That was actually going to be one of my questions because I want to see this thing now. <laughs> oh, oh, well, good. I think they did do a lovely, gentle job with it. I was grateful. Well, today I'm drinking a cup of Yorkshire Gold tea. What are you drinking? I wish I was drinking a cup of Yorkshire Gold tea. That's my favorite. But I'm just drinking water because I'm in the Nashville area and we have a heat wave. (laughs) (laughs) So cheers. (laughs) Cheers. If I do manage to make it past Nashville at the end of the year, I'm going to bring you a supply of Yorkshire Gold tea. I have a supplier. Oh, that's so kind. (laughs) I try to load up when I can, but I I run out because we drink a lot of it. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, when I when I go home to visit, I always go with basically an empty suitcase because I need to bring back English supplies. That's wise. Jaffa mm. cakes and all sorts of things, right? They don't have proper biscuits here. I actually have a Jaffa cake supplier as well. Uh, Ooh, you sound like if, if you play your cards right, I might bring you some of those as well. Okay, okay, I'll kiss up. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's begin by talking about Oxford. All right. What is your favorite place to go uh, when you visit Oxford, or what do you recommend other people to see? Mm. Well, this is, um, I'm going to give you the absolute nerdy bibliophile answer, but perfect. I love the Bodleian Library. You could just sit me in there. I just, mm. I feel smarter <laughs> just by <laughs> sitting there. <laughs> it's a confidence booster, regardless if you read anything or not. But I just love the, the levels of it and everything. And I love the Duke Humphreys room where, you know, there are still books that are secured to the bookshelves because of their worth from medieval times, you know, that sort of thing. I love the, I love the Bodleian Library. But probably one of my favorite things there um, for anyone to be able to do would be to walk around Christchurch Meadows. Mm. I love Christchurch Meadows and doing the loops. You kind of have a bit of everything. You get to see the cows, you get to see the fields, you get to walk down towards the river, you get to see the back of Christchurch, which is gorgeous. And it's um, 
you know, it's not a taxing walk, but it's just beautiful and contemplative and lovely. And you can jog it multiple times or you can walk it slowly. I love walking out to the Trout and Binzi Lane. I love lots of walking. Mm -hmm. The Botanical Gardens are another favorite of mine. Um, Just visiting the colleges. All the colleges are so different and they remind me a bit in and of themselves of Narnia. You know, you're on a a kind of a busy road and then all of a sudden you pop in through a gate and there's a whole other world. Mm -hmm. They have beautiful gardens and grounds or... uh, St. Edmund's Hall has a crypt, you know, it's, they all have these quirky little things that are there. So I love, I love the various colleges and and lots of places to walk. Hmm. It's one of my lifelong goals to produce an MP3 or like a podcast tour of Oxford and just get a bunch of scholars in there to not only tell you the things that you're going past, but sort of connect it all to the inklings. Because there are some inklings related tours, but at least from their promotional materials, I haven't been particularly impressed, particularly when I see C.S. Lewis misquotes on those promotional materials. Mm, that's true. That's sad. And when we were there last year, actually, it was sad to see that the Burden Babe was closed. Mm-hmm. And I've heard it's closed. So that was really sad to trek out there. So um, the Lamb and Flag has been reopened um, yes. a bit, at least. And I've always loved that in the Turl and the Bear and, and whatnot. But that was worrying. Yeah. And it's been shut for a while. It was, it was shut pre-COVID. Oh, okay. So watch this space. I still think some uh, American C.S. Lewis Society should just buy it and be done with it. Right, right. Because I heard some bizarre gossip that it might be a bed and breakfast or something like that. I Mm -hmm. don't know. I haven't heard its fate yet, but it was just sad to see it boarded up. And when we were there, actually several other, it was at night, um, later at night, and lots of people stopped to mourn that. It's like a pilgrimage people take out there. <laughs> <laughs> but that was sad because I, I had gone there many a time um, as a mm. student too. So, well, I remember seeing a documentary once that on the anniversary of Tolkien's death, Tolkien fans gather at his grave and uh, sing an elvish chant in mourning. Oh, I want Lewis fans to do the same at The Burden Baby, uh, The Eagle mm. and Child, but mm. sing uh, the language of Old Sola, like the Hrossa when Hoy has his funeral. I think that would be perfect. Unfortunately, we don't have enough material to make that song. But if anyone out there is a music major and they want to project, that's my challenge to you. <laughs> that would be a great challenge. Out of out of deference and respect to Lewis, I would not sing, but you wouldn't want me singing. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we've warmed up talking about Oxford in, in the general. I just really wanted to create some space for you to share a little bit about yourself, about your your journey, how you were surprised by Oxford. Well, thank you. Thank you. The title itself came up. I I mean, I am a fan of Lewis's and I was trying to evoke, obviously, his memoir, although not at all, claiming it all to be in the same level or anything at all. But um, when I arrived at Oxford, I actually did not know Lewis as a Christian in that sense. I was, you know, um, much more familiar with the Narnia series and whatnot. Loosely speaking, you know, David, I had grown up in a a home that was kind of loosely Catholic, but not really a, a home with any kind of faith. And like many other homes, my family was loving, loving enough to get by, but broken enough not to deserve God's attention is how I would have put it in a sense. Um, divorced parents eventually, growing cynicism towards God, went to college and um, you know was asking a lot of questions, studying world religions, things like that. But I wouldn't have called myself an atheist, but, but most likely an agnostic because I couldn't disprove God. I did have this magical sense of reading Lewis when I was young. I'd always loved reading and my mom had read to me a lot and that sort of thing. But when I when I got to Oxford, I started asking more questions about um, world religions and about meaning and met Christians and wrangled with it quite intensively and eventually became a Christian at Oxford. And when I went back years later to write about that experience, um, really in many ways inspired by my students and um, and by wanting to share that with friends and family who didn't know about my faith in that sense. Lewis's sort of uh, title seemed to kind of sit with my heart. But as I said, I didn't know that story when I first arrived. And so I came to know of Lewis and others, um, the Inklings, whatnot, through friends and community and and whatnot as I was beginning my studies there at Oxford. And I was really impressed and moved by them asking these questions about these works not being trite, you know, um, some of them being openly theological, but some of them being, you know, fictional, metaphorical from all different angles, And uh, but asking these really great and important questions. And so I was 
really moved by that group and got to know. And of course, Dorothy Sayers and, you know, others that were famously there as well that were friends of the Inklings or connected. Um, there were many women thinkers too. So I was also studying women writers. So I think eventually after I became a Christian, after that first year or so there, those were huge influences on me. I had read Sheldon Van Auken and other writers in mm-hmm. that group as well. So that's where the title came from. Yeah. In your book, you spoke about a severe mercy and you honed in on the, the same point that really struck my co-host Matt, who was also in Oxford questioning the existence of God, the truth of Christianity, mm. where Van Orkin realizes that he can't quite bring himself to take the next step, but then he sort of metaphorically looks back and sees that he's come too far to retreat to where he once was before. Right. And perhaps the the, the, the next step forward was, uh, wasn't actually as big as it would have been to try and return to his previous worldview. It's funny you should mention that exact instant because that was probably one of the most um, impactful moments for me in the book that challenged me at the time. And I was reading it. I did not have a Christian faith either. I was actually teetering. And I was was kind of that lowest prayer in the whole Bible of, you know, help me in my unbelief. I want to believe, Mm -hmm. but I can't. And I was moved by, everyone talks about this leap of faith moving forward or this taking this jump forward. And I was really struck by Vanakin's description of it being more of looking at the gap backward and and not being able to deny Christ and who he was. And I realized that he was who he said he was and is. And um, I couldn't say that he wasn't. And that changed everything. And that you get to a point where you can't, you can't go back. You can't unhear it. You can't undo it. Hmm. And there you said he was who he said he was. That one thing I noticed in your book is that the trilemma, Lewis's trilemma from mere Christianity does make an appearance. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, and that Lord liar of lunatic argument, but it still st- holds very strong. And and if he is Lord, that changes everything. I'm interested. What role did your study of the Romantics play in your story? You you allude to it a, f- a good few times, but I was just I would just really appreciate it if you would share with our listeners. Well, firstly, who are the Romantics? Because uh, I didn't know who they were until a few years ago. Um, <laughs> but who were they and, and what role did they play in your journey towards Christianity? Yeah, they're more than a 90s band, right? I think it was, <laughs> well, that was a good good music then too. But um, it's funny, I believe God speaks to us in all of our various own individual love languages, right? As Augustine says, he loves each of us as if we're the only one. And I entered Oxford studying the Romantics because I loved – I loved all literature and all periods, but the Romantic period in, in general is usually defined about 17, 1780s to 1850s, sometimes a little bit shorter or longer, usually marked by the death of Wordsworth, who lived forever and ever and ever. But it's an interesting period marked by revolution, so anticipating the French Revolution and then into um, the 19th century. And so it's often seen as first generation and second generation. It's quite long. So your first generation are those that are really marked by the revolution and more revolutionary writers. You're William Blake, Coleridge Wordsworth writing something like Lyrical Ballads um, very famously in 1798, which is just a really turning point in poetic development. Um, going into your later second generation poets who are shaped by the first generation, like your Piercy Bush Shelley, John Keats, Mary Shelley, those groups. So I was really fascinated by their interest, both generations really, in in longing, in human longing, in mm. infinite longing, what Goethe identifies as this infinite longing. And really, I think in many ways, what Lewis calls, you know, sunsucked, right? He pulls from that German notion of something we long for that is familiar and unfamiliar at the same time that we recognize and and brings us a flash of joy or brings us a flash of some kind of soul homesickness, but we can't quite put our finger on it because we haven't known it fully in this fallen world. But we know it to foreshadow something to come. And they all seem to be grasping at this in some way, shape, or form, and even through Byron somewhat ironically. So there's this way in which I was really interested in their relationship to desire and longing having no idea at the time that being immersed in them in that way, especially in something like the MPhil studies where you're really, really immersed in these, in these thinkers was in a way stoking that longing that I had Mm. within myself that I think is really the definition of what it means to be human. Um, Our own human dignity made in the image of God, but also this sense of what we are longing for. We're longing to be seen and we're longing to be known and, and we're longing for something that we know is not right here to be set right. And they were all painting those in various hues. So I do think it's telling, you know, that Lewis pulls his title, Surprised by Joy, from a Wordsworth poem. 
Hmm. as much as you know he's in tension in some ways with the romantics but i think that idea of longing for um for something to that's been lost to be recovered is really at the heart of romantic poetry yeah i like the way that you put that it's stoking that longing it, it kind of makes me think of when somebody asks you if you want any lunch and you realize that you haven't eaten yet and you suddenly realize you're absolutely famished sometimes somebody pointing out the things you're actually longing for help you see them in a clearer relief. And the more they talk about what we're going to be having for lunch, it's just like, shut up and feed me now. <laughs> well, exactly, because we don't realize how hungry or thirsty we are. You know, it's like Lewis says, the Lord says, take and eat, not take and think. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> take, take and understand even. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did you go about the process of getting your story down on paper? Because I've listened to other interviews that you've given, and you've, you've given this quotation that selection is the hardest part of creation. Mm. Just so I'm fair there, I'm I'm actually paraphrasing Coleridge. <laughs> Steal from the best. <laughs> he says it's really painful. Um, and that was really painful. I think for any writer or artist, right, how much do we actually share? And uh, and what do we actually select? I have a friend who's a filmmaker who says the most painful parts are the pieces left on the floor, right? You know, that part that you live with that. Mm -hmm. No one else knows. You probably know this in your edits too. You live with actually what is not shared more than what is shared. But I had always been trained as an academic writer, David. So it, for me, it was a really weird and new genre. I never would have thought I would have written a memoir. Hmm. I haven't really had particularly any kind of noteworthy life, you know, relatively, I guess we all do, but you know, in that sense, but it was something I felt really compelled to start writing about um, more and more as I thought about sharing my faith. And so it was a whole different way of writing. I wrote a few chapters to start and had some feedback from my agent and other friends in that. And then I just kind of wrote it all. I, I wrote it all out while I was on sabbatical for a large part because I was at a secular institution at the time that didn't want me to publish on my faith before tenure. So um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of those kind of elements when you're a person of Christian faith and in, in um, academia. So trying to kind of walk those wires carefully. But I think uh, eventually I did write it more at a pace, but I think I had a dear friend of mine say to me, you know, write something like this that's personal. Write it as though you're going to put the first manuscript in a golden chest that no one else will ever read, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and then you can sit with it and think about how you really want to trim that story and use that story and honor people in it and, you know, and, and write about others as you would want to have been written about, you know, and if you have to write about somebody in a way that you wouldn't want to have been written about the old golden rule, then change the identifying details you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> or their names or something. And so it, it was quite a spiritual discipline process, but also something that was really important to me. I felt in this way with particularly with this book that I really wrote it in blood. Like I wrote it from my heart in a really vulnerable way, but also for the people in, in many ways that I care very deeply about my own family and friends and unbelieving family and friends and um, students and things from a way of just wanting to share not heavy handedly, but just what this thought process was for me. When I started giving my, uh, my own testimony, my own explanations to why I'm a Christian, I started to realize that this is exactly what the gospel writers did. They're all telling the same story ultimately, but they realize that there are some things that they have to telescope. There's some things that they have to leave out just yes. because of space, because yep. of relevance, because of who their audience is, the thing that they really need to know. And when you were talking about using the golden rule when you're writing about people, it made me chuckle because I realized that the gospel writers didn't always do that. I think St. John really wanted us to know that he beat St. Peter in a running race to the empty tomb. I was just thinking of that because I have <laughs> twin boys. And I remember reading when, I, when we read that passage together, they just so resonate with that because that's exactly the kind of detail that they would, they still would hold. That was just in my head. <laughs> that's crazy. Because I know you can't make this stuff up. And this is, I think, why the Bible so spoke to me was when I first read it, I was really prepared to be cynical about it and to discount it and to think, okay, I'm going to read this and use it as fodder to just knock down these crazy Christian weirdos. And then I started reading it and I realized actually in a very literary sense, how much sense it made. Mm. The whole story, overarching story and all the prophecies and everything else, but also the humanity of it. There was something in there for everyone. And there were facets of myself and everything. But there was also this way in which these little details, you, you just can't make this stuff up. I made it so much more human and real and believable, you know, to competitive disciples racing to the tomb and, and the folding of the clothes, like an act has been done and finished. And, you know, the way that angels are cited and how they're described, it entirely makes sense. 
even inconcurrently makes it make more sense. It's just, you can't make this stuff up. Yeah. I like that section of your book where you, you spoke about, well, firstly, not stealing a Bible from a church. I know. I, I didn't have it in me. <laughs> <laughs> this might still be true. Then I believe that's a bit of a no-no. But, but it did make me wonder, because I was, I was raised in the faith, so I always knew like, large chunks of scripture. It was, you know, it was the water that I swam in, in many ways. Mm. And trying to think what it would be like cracking open a Bible for the first time mm -hmm. and only having sort of a cursory understanding of, of sort of what culture around me had given me. Mm -hmm. You just like to speak a little bit more to that. What was that process like? It's a great question because I think I'm a very good example of someone who would go through the public school system. I mean, I had gone through the public school system for what, 18 years or something, you know, at that point, 16 years or something like that, and never had cracked open a Bible. It's shocking that it's not even assigned as just historical reading in many ways. Hmm. I mean, I think as an undergraduate, I had an 18th century professor who recommended reading some of it because of the footnotes and allusions. But in our mainstream North American culture, I think Dorothy Sayers is right. We use and speak about it all the time, and we have no idea from whence it's coming. That is actually the source, not only of Christian ethics for our, our ethics today, but also um, that are very different from the time of Herod, you know, to, uh, to just phrases and things we use, and we don't know where they come from. So I was really amazed at how the overall story was. I, I remember first reading Genesis, just starting with Genesis. I just started at the beginning because the beginning is always a good place to start. It's a very good place to start. I didn't know where to go, you know, and those little tissue paper pages are horrendous and overwhelming <laughs> and, you know, so intimidating. And Genesis just made so much sense. It just, the fallen world made so much sense in terms of understanding how evil and how it's come into the world and how our world has fallen and the fallen world and, and living with the suffering in that and thinking about where is God? Where is God in all this? You know, the, the very typical, very understandable questions and really looking at, you know, he didn't leave us. We left him, you know, and Adam and Eve eat of the fruit and he's coming to ask where we are in the garden. And, and whether you read these things literally or metaphorically, however, they, they ripple out, they're incredibly potent and powerful even stronger than myth, to which all the myths point, if we think about Tolkien, but this way in which mm. they, it resonated really deeply psychologically for how we function. And I got to the end of Genesis and I thought, oh my goodness, you know, here's these people manipulating blessings from their elderly parents and acting, you know, like jerks and, you know, <laughs> kill, one brother killing another. And you're like, but that's how we are. Like, this isn't, it's not like this lineage handed through these absolutely pristine people. Everything made so much sense, actually, strangely, you know, even though it is a different world historically, hmm. there were still very, very timeless truths about our, ourselves and the way that we hide from our sin. And that was tremendously inconvenient. <laughs> 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 when I got to the end of Genesis, I was like, oh my, oh, shoot. <laughs> yeah. And you hadn't even got to judges yet. Where things no. get really wild. <laughs> no. And then when you think about the New Testament, a lot of people in our culture don't even under understand the difference between New and Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Nothing like that. And that, again, is not a condescending or elitist comment. It's just that there's this, you do understand what someone like T.S. Eliot saying, what a grieving, this dissociation of sensibility, grieving this sense of these stories that regardless of what your religious position are, are just this wealth of psychological insight into human nature and a common universal collective unconscious type story. And we're broken and fragmented from that. Hmm. When I was back in England, I taught a confirmation class and I, I was horrified with children that have been going to religious schools, submitting themselves for a confirmation class. They knew nothing. It was, it was incredibly depressing. And it was actually only when I read more Lewis that I started seeing this as, as, as more hopeful. Mm -hmm. Because in a letter that he writes to, I think it's Sister Penelope, he says, I think we can use this great ignorance for the evangelism of England. Basically, because people actually no longer know the scriptural story, we can actually represent that scriptural story under another guise, such as this season's book, Out of the Silent Planet, and explore mm -hmm. a lot of those ideas. And people will be none the wiser, uh, at least initially, as to what he's actually doing, the spell that he's weaving, and thereby encounter the gospel afresh in the pages of a book, which uh, is actually communicating another story entirely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's very, very interesting. And that's one of the other powers of the Bible story 
the greatest story in that sense is it just keeps having this resurrecting power. It just keeps rolling back into these truths that lie too deep for Frost and they still emanate everywhere. And I think that's why I enjoy someone like Dorothy Sayers' theology. You know, she's often known for writing her mysteries and things, but you know, when she talks about the the dogma, the drama being in the dogma. Is the drama. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Looking again with new eyes at how exciting this story actually is. I was I was shocked at how really exciting the story of Jesus was and really moving and really radical. And then I was also ticked off and grieved that no one had told me such. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, this uh, this past uh, Holy Week, I was reading The Man Born to be King, which is Dorothy Sayers. Is- ah, I'm reading that too. I'm actually reviewing that book right now. It's fantastic. That's my contribution to your review. I think it's fantastic. It, oh, thank you. I do too. It's, it is. It fills in so much, so much of the background, all of the little details, as well as some fun little tidbits mm-hmm. throughout. But I'd, I'd heard that Lewis read that each Holy Week as part of his devotion. I'm not such a quick reader, so I don't get through it in Holy Week, but I begin it in Holy Week. <laughs> That's that's a good place to begin. And I, I actually think the first play is one of my favorites anyway. Mm-hmm. So what do you find is the biggest misunderstanding that people have about your book since you, since you brought it out? Oh, gosh. Um, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> that's what every author has. Wow, there are as many ways to misunderstand something much more than to understand it. It's interesting. I find sometimes Christian readers maybe look it up thinking, you know, they recognize the evocation of Lewis and they expect it to be maybe much, much more theological. Mm -hmm. And then the opposite, I have people who've picked it up, mainstream secular readers, whatever, and they're like, oh, this is a faith story. Mm -hmm. As I, again, try not to be heavy handed about it um, or alter callish about it, but, you know, you, you tip your aces a bit. And it's an interesting book. It took a while to find its place in terms of being published as well, you know, kind of people don't mind God, but they don't really want Jesus, mm-hmm. you know, in, in mainstream and then vice versa. Um, the same thing with the film. So I think probably misunderstandings maybe more, um, not so much with the content or what itself, but with the expectation the reader's bringing into it. Mm. One of the things I liked about your book was it felt like there was more wrestling time. Mm. Very often with testimony books, you just sort of get handed an argument for God or Jesus, and then that's mm. the knock them down kind of argument, and then boom, it's 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 all done and dusted. But reading your book, you could feel the, well, as Lewis would say, the, the approach of him whom I most earnestly desired not to meet. <laughs> that's right. There also was a, a, a conflict within you, because here is a worldview that offers an answer to that longing that you have, but the answer that you get is also not quite the answer that you want. Right. There might be nicer alternatives, gentler alternatives. Yes. He is not safe, but he's good. Mm -hmm. Right. And then what about the movie? Uh, How did that even come about? Oh, so that was interesting. Over the years, I'd written this book probably 10, 12 years ago, actually, when I think about it now. It was a while ago. It was when I'm back when I was on sabbatical and my twins were little. Bravo, by the way. I mean, writing a book is one thing. Writing it while you have twins, it's like, that's just showing off. <laughs> no, trust me. I just hid in a closet and wrote most of it on a two by four while my my husband chased three kids under three um, to gra- get a few minutes. Remember, we were talking earlier about, you know, children being a great cure for writer's block. Mm-hmm. There's not much time, but after it came out, there were a few times where I was approached by a few different people who wanted to do it as a film project, especially maybe related to varsity or, or, you know, university students, things like that. But it was a project really close to my heart that I wanted to be very careful about and given God and um, wanting that to have integrity and, and also my family and, you know, my parents still alive and that sort of thing too. So it had been tabled, but I, a few years ago, gosh, a couple of years before COVID, probably five or six years ago now, Ryan Smith reached out to me. He's a, an amazing writer, a screenplay writer. And whilst we were in Canada, and he seemed very, very serious and thoughtful about it um, and actually expressed to me over a series of phone calls what he wanted to do and how he wanted to approach it. And I appreciated his previous work and I appreciated what he was doing and how he was conceiving of it and how respectful and gentle he was about it. And um, And we talked it through for some time. We'd actually had I had come down and visited a few times with some other talks and things as well before COVID hit. 
I thought, okay, I think him and his team actually evolve studios and whatnot. Have a have a grasp of how I would like this to be able to be the kind of film that Tolkien could have brought Lewis to before he was a believer. <laughs> <laughs> Save all of that walking around Addison's Walk. Here, just I watch would like this. it to be an Addison Walk or a Binzi Lane film. You know, you could go and have a few pints after. And I felt that he caught that spirit of it. And um, and he's a fellow bibliophile in that as well. And so our friendship grew and there were other intersections. It was really interesting of just other people I knew from actually other worlds, education and whatnot, that were also coming in on this. It was just really neat. And so it kind of all congregated here in the Nashville area with the creative group here. And then COVID hit and the way that theaters were affected and everything just seemed to table everything. We thought this might never happen. And then actually it was really interesting, David, when it did, it happened quite quickly. And so a lot of it was filmed last year quite quickly after all. And it will be apparently the film with the most cinematography of Oxford ever shot. Oh. It's beautiful. It is gorgeous. The trailer is just beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, they did, it's beautiful. It set up the longing in me. <laughs> oh, it, 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 the dreaming spires. It, it is beautiful. And um, by grace of God, even with the pandemic, we were given access to locations we thought we would never have had access to. And I think they did a very beautiful and gentle and inviting job. The score, the musical score is stunning as well and contemplative. And um, and so it kind of all came together. So that was something that had been several years in the making, thought it would be tabled. And then hopefully in the Lord's timing, it actually has come together. So that's been um, a blessing. What was it like meeting the fictional you? Oh my God. That's got to be weird. That was weird. Never, <laughs> ever, ever in a million years. So never in a million years would I have thought I'd become a Christian. <laughs> and then never in a million years would I have thought I'd written a memoir, nor have had a film. To meet your own doppelganger <laughs> is really bizarre. Rose Reed, who plays me, which sounds so strange, is delightful. She's a delightful person and a bibliophile herself, loves books, loves reading, has a gentle, sweet spirit. She's also just a very committed actress and of deep faith. And it was just lovely meeting her, very surreal, but really lovely. Um, so it, it has been a bit strange, but it's also been interesting. I mean, it's different from the book too, and there's an interpretation in that way, and it has to be mm -hmm. that sense. So to also be able to kind of see that once removed mm -hmm. has a different um, a different layer to it. You just hope that it will encourage others to at least ask questions. And if anyone's listening who ultimately films my biopic, I, I think Brad Pitt would be a perfect <laughs> David Bates in that movie. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I love can, it. We can call it Surprise by America. There you go. I've even yes. given you the title. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've been surprised by America as well. So <laughs> <laughs> Yes, because you're you're one of the good ones, aren't you? <laughs> oh. It's sweet. Yeah, it's um it was it was really neat. It was it was also wonderful to meet some of the actors there and some people are people of faith working on the film, some people are not, but it had a wonderful feeling and camaraderie and um great group. So that was a delight too. And you said it should be on more general release by the end of the year, sometime in the fall? Yeah. We weren't sure for a while what was happening. I'm I'm new to all of this kind of thing, but it can take a bit, you know, once a film is done um, in distribution. So the latest update I just have recently was that it would be most likely coming out in fall, I think, late fall. Um, so it, there should be a more formal update soon. Wonderful. Uh, I'm going to announce that we're going to have a, a Patreon watch along at some point when it is released on a streaming platform that we can sort out. Oh, thank you. That'll be a delight. So in the remainder of our time, I just wanted to ask, what have you been up to since you were surprised by Oxford? Since you wrote that book, I understand you've written several others. Well, several would be generous, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I've had another baby, so maybe that counts. Um, <laughs> that totally counts. <laughs> totally counts as word count. <laughs> <laughs> I've done a couple other books. I did do um, a book called Holy as the Day, which was a really beautiful book for me personally. I started it actually as a as kind of a journaling account, David, of when I was pregnant with our surprise menopause baby who faced some health complications and a, a difficult pregnancy and whatnot with him. And and um, I ended up um, publishing that with IVP, a wonderful group for a women's line. Uh, I just really wanted to practice the art of paying attention. I'd been really blessed to work at some Jesuit institutions in the past. And I love the tradition, the Ignatian tradition of the examine and of looking at ourselves and of um, the spiritual exercises. 
And so it kind of revolves around that at the essence of it, but it's not a doctrinal book. It's more looking at how to kind of pay attention in our lives. I was really inspired by Frederick Buechner's work in that line as well. Hmm. He's one of my favorite authors. And then I, I did do I'm surprised as well. I wouldn't have anticipated ever t- writing a book with sex in its title, but I did write a book called Sex in the City of God later. I remember um, Bono saying of you too that he loves the Old Testament, like even the wacky bits that nobody wants to read. Mm-hmm. And even Lord Byron said that, that the Old Testament <laughs> is just crazy and, and you can't make this stuff up. But again, fascinated by the genealogy and that there was sort of this history of sex in a sense in the Bible and also looking at um, what it means to have to be married to Christ first and looking at some of the tropes that I think can be kind of weird as well to people from the outside. So, you know, when you say what it's like to sit down with the Bible if you've never read it and, and you've grown up immersed in it and somebody who hasn't, it is intimidating to know what's the difference between the Old and the New Testament. It is intimidating to try and look up the tissue paper, you know, pages quickly. But it also is weird to hear phrases like, the church and his bride. You're like, what the heck? That sounds like, you know, a 1930s Frankenstein movie. So, <laughs> but actually, what does that mean? And so I explored a bit in that book, but playing with a pun on the title of the cultural notions of sex in the city, you know, which was a big TV show at the time. And so I tried to explore some of those things. So those are some of the other projects I've done. And I've done some poetry as well. I've been really enjoying poetry. I, I have a quite a heavy teaching load. I love my students. So usually I'm I'm teaching more so during the academic year, but um, I'm currently working on a life of Herod and a life of Jesus for um, the British podcast group Noiser, which is a wonderful group there too. So doing um, some historical dramatic writing as well, a bit in the vein of, of Sayers in that sense. Wonderful. Well, I'd love to have you back on next season when we have another round of Jack's Bookshelf to speak about some of these romantic poets. Oh, I love the romantic poets. I'd love that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you for coming on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And as the landlord rings the bell for final drinks, can you please tell us where people can find out more about you and pick up a copy of Surprise by Oxford? I guess probably the best spot is my website, carolynweber.com. And um, you can always drop me a note through there too. I try to respond personally to all, all notes. And you can click through my books there or on Amazon as well. I am on Twitter. And I don't have a huge social media platform. I'm not too techie, but I do <laughs> like to reply to people personally. Wonderful. Well, there'll be links to all of those in the show notes. And thanks again to Carolyn Weber for coming on the show. Thanks to our audio engineer, Taylor Scholl. Thanks to all of our listeners, patron supporters, and particularly our top tier supporters, Matt One, Matt Two, Jake, Erica, Marvin, Joel, Deborah, Amanda, Emmy, Thomas, Bill, Joanna, Bud, Shane, Kay, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Stephen, Kelly, Chris, James, Kate, Peter, David, Angela, and Rowdy. We pray for you all every week and all of the prayer requests on our Slack channel. And if you enjoyed this episode, please tell a friend and get a group together to go and see Surprise by Oxford when it comes out, hopefully this fall. And please join us next time when we'll continue going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.